Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk Omnichannel Order Management Flows. My name is Evan and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation and by participating in the session using Microsoft Teams, your name, email address, phone number, and or title may be viewable by other session participants. If you do not consent to being a part of a recorded session, please disconnect at this time. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout the event. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Now let's get started. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Holly Haynes, Principal Program Manager Lead. Holly, over to you. Great, thanks Evan. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. As mentioned, my name is Holly Haynes and I'm a Principal Program Manager on the Dynamics 365 Commerce team. Uh, I am joined today on the call by another Program Manager from our team, Ruben Delgado. He will be assisting with uh, responding to any Q&A that you guys may, uh, may write in the uh, Q&A area during the presentation. And we'll uh, do our best to allocate some time at the end to cover any uh, Q&A that maybe uh, we want to want to do live uh, for everybody to hear. Um, today's Tech Talk is all about omnichannel order management with Dynamics 365 Commerce. Some of you may refer to this as cross-channel management or multi-channel management, but in general, our focus today is how Dynamics 365 Commerce can support options for creating orders in one channel and then editing or canceling or fulfilling or even returning them in another channel. Um, so let's get started with the content. Uh, we'll start uh, just by covering the agenda. We'll start by defining what channels we support in Dynamics 365 Commerce and how we refer to the different types of orders that be, can be created in these channels. And then we'll take some time to review at a high level as to how orders are synchronized into our central order management database. We'll then outline uh, various supported flows that we have in our application so that you can understand where you can create orders, edit orders, fulfill and return orders, and, and how that works across different channels. We'll then take a look at an end-to-end -end demo where we'll do a full, uh, you know, all channels uh, included uh, example of how we can, uh, you know, buy in one channel, edit in another, and pick up in another. And then finally, we'll touch on some things that you would want to consider if you plan on using omnichannel capabilities or, or deploying them for maybe your customers if you're uh, on the implementation partner side. So first, let's just make sure we are all on the same page and, and define the channels that we support in Dynamics 365 Commerce. Um, out of the box, we have three uh, supported channels. Uh, we have the physical stores, the online stores, and the call center channel. Physical stores would use our Dynamics 365 Commerce point of sale as their main application for creating and managing orders. Um, in the online channel, we would take advantage of our new Dynamics 365 e-commerce platform. That would be the kind of input channel for creating uh, new orders through that channel. And then the call center channel leverages the back office interface of the Dynamics 365 Commerce application for creating and managing orders. Uh, we sometimes refer to this as Commerce HQ. Um, for those of you who have been working with our product for a while, you may also know this as Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations. Um, but essentially, the, the back office or the headquarters is that core ERP solution that all of our master data is founded in. And it's important to note that within our product, we have two different types of orders. You have cash and carry and customer order. Uh, the term cash and carry just implies that the transaction is created and fully invoiced, fulfilled in a single step. So don't be confused by the term cash. Uh, they don't have to pay with cash for these transactions. In general, just think of this as a typical store transaction. A customer brings items to the counter, a sales associate rings them up, the customer pays and leaves with their product. That would be the definition of a cash and carry transaction. These transaction types don't have as many omni-channel requirements because they can't be edited uh, and, and they don't really have a life cycle, um, except they can be returned. Uh, the main type of order that we're gonna focus on today for what we, we are 
talking about with omni-channel order management is what we call the customer order. The customer order can be created in any of our supported channels. And a customer order is really just defined as an order that has a life cycle. Um, so what I mean by that is unlike a cash and carry, the order isn't immediately finalized at the very same time that it got created. Customer orders go through much more complex order fulfillment and billing cycles. Um, and if you think about it, customer orders can get really complex over time if they contain multiple sales lines, sales lines can split, they could be fulfilled at different times. Uh, just as an example, imagine a customer purchasing a dress and a pair of shoes, uh, maybe through the online channel that they want to be shipped to their home. Maybe the dress is in stock and it gets picked and packed and shipped to the customer the next day, but the shoes may be on back order. So that line will remain open and will ship separately. Uh, another example could be related just to uh, the single sales order line. So imagine a customer orders three pairs of socks, but only two are in stock. Two pairs are shipped and invoiced the next day while one of those pairs of socks remains on back order. So we would refer to that as what we call a partially invoiced sales line. So, you know, those sales lines, whether it be for a back order pair of shoes or the sales line that has one pair of socks that's still open and remaining to be shipped, can potentially go through a lot of changes over time. Um, the customer may call and decide to cancel those shoes before they ship. Uh, they may call back about the socks. Maybe they receive the first two pair and they love them so much they want to increase their order quantity from three to five. Um, so in general, customer order lines are more fluid and they're more subject to change over time. Uh, in order for us to kind of keep track of the status of these more complex orders, we rely on uh, some data in the back office. We typically rely on the inventory transactions in Commerce Headquarters, along with line statuses to sort of help us understand if the order is, you know, fully invoiced or partially back ordered or, um, you know, um, maybe just picked but not yet packed. Those statuses help us out through that process. Uh, as a reminder, the only channel where you can create both of these order types that I just covered is in a store. So um, the physical store, you can create both cash and carry and customer orders through our POS application. But when you create orders through the online channel or through the call center channel, these are always considered customer orders by definition. So how do these cash and carry orders and customer orders end up all living happily together in one common master order database? Um, well, honestly, that's the beauty of omni-channel commerce. Um, so the high level flow here should help you uh, hopefully clarify how orders are ultimately processed and how they end up in the Dynamics 365 back office. Um, the back office is where we centralize all of our commerce orders and it's where you know, all the sales order master records are maintained. So if we look at the top section of this graphic, we can start with the easiest channel on the left, the call center channel. The call center channel, channel users input their orders right from an application that's directly connected to the back office. So any orders that you create through the call center channel are going to be written to that centralized order database in real time. Now for orders that are created in the point of sale or e-commerce channels, there's more of a distributed architecture. Um, and this architecture is critical to the overall performance and reliability of our solution. Uh, you know, imagine if we had a customer who had thousands of stores and millions of online shoppers all trying to read and write uh, order transaction data from one shared order database in real time. Um, as you can imagine, that would be a recipe for a disaster from a performance perspective. So this is why for those channels, uh, the, the store and the e-commerce channel, we currently rely on a distributed architecture. Uh, architecture. Uh, the store and the e-commerce channels are connected initially to what we call the commerce scale unit. That commerce scale unit has its own business logic and its own database and we refer to that as the channel database. A single organization may deploy multiple commerce scale units depending on their size. And essentially using that commerce scale unit provides a buffer uh, to, the, to the back office and ensures that we can handle that heavy transaction volume without having performance issues. 
So as customer orders or cash and carry orders are created uh, in either the pause or e-commerce channels, and again, remember cash and carry can only be created in point of sale. Um, as these orders are initially created in those two channels, though, they're first stored in the channel database. And then depending on your system configuration, they are uploaded to the HQ, the back office, either using a real-time service or an asynchronous batch job. Uh, now, as the name implies, when you use a real-time service, the transaction ends up in the back office in real time. But using the real-time service does have limitations and should be done with some caution. Uh, there is a price to pay for this uh, benefit of having the real-time service. If you're processing heavy volumes of transactions or if you have many stores or e-commerce orders that are coming through your pipeline, we always encourage the use of our asynchronous model rather than real-time service. It's important to note also that the cash and carry orders that come through your point of sale application can never hit the back office using a real-time service. Those transactions will always go through asynchronous processing. Uh, it's only the customer orders that you do have an option of whether you create those in real time or asynchronously. Uh, a final note on asynchronous processing, don't think of asynchronous as slow. Uh, these are, these processes are run via batch jobs and you can run them essentially every minute. So the time between when the order is created in the channel database versus when it actually becomes available in, in the back office is very minimal when you're using the async uh, jobs. So if you are having performance issues with customer orders and you're currently using the real-time service, um, we would highly recommend considering a move to async processing. Okay, so now that you understand the difference between cash and carry and customer order, and you have a little bit better understanding of how orders get created in the channels and ultimately how they all end up centralized in the back office central database, um, let's discuss how we can support different combinations of cross-channel order flows. So as I mentioned, customer orders can go through a complex life cycle. Once they are created, they can be fulfilled, finalized, uh, you know, that's kind of the happy path. So the order can go in, it gets picked, packed and shipped or picked up. And, uh, you know, that, that's what we, you know, would like to, to see in most cases. I'll talk about some more complex flows in a minute. Um, so when you think about sort of the happy path, uh, these are the flows that we currently support out of the box. Um, and I won't read all of them. You can kind of read them yourself on the slide, these different bulleted uh, points, but just to make sure we're clear on terminology, when we say something like buy online, pick up in a store, that essentially means you're creating the order initially through an online channel, but you're going to execute the fulfillment um, or the shipment or the pickup through a point of sale application, which is, which is linked to a point of sale channel. Um, when we talk about something like buy online, ship to home, uh, that would essentially mean you're, you're placing the order in the online channel, um, but it's actually going to go through the pick, pack, and ship processing through the back office. So we don't really have a channel name for the back office. Um, it's not really a channel in its, itself, but you would be using sort of the supply chain capabilities of the Dynamics Commerce headquarters to do your picking, packing, and shipping. Um, so just to give you a general idea of what these different uh, channels uh, and, and uh, what these different bullet points mean. So as we mentioned, not every order goes through the happy path. Um, after it's created, it may have to be edited. It may have to be fully or partially canceled. So here is a list of the flows that we support when it comes to cross channel um, and one that we don't support. Um, so when we look at the ones that are supported, again, just to be clear, when I say buy online, edit or cancel in call center, what that means is you're creating the order through the commerce site or the online channel, and then a user is able to then uh, access that order through the call center user interface and edit or cancel it through call center. Um, again, I won't read through all of these different ones. You can uh, certainly read the bullet points, but I do want to call out the fourth bullet point that says buy in call center with enable order completion equals false and edit or cancel and pause. And I'm going to, uh, in a moment, switch to the next slide and we're going to dig into what enable order completion means because I want to make sure that everyone understands what that terminology means and how that flag uh, that you configure on the call center channel can impact what you can do in terms of editing. 
Um, but as you can see, if you buy in a call center channel where the call center has an able order completion false, you will be able to, if you need to, recall that order in a point of sale device in a store channel and edit or cancel it. But if you look at the scenario that's not supported, uh, if you buy in a call center and the enable order completion setting on your call center channel is true, you won't be able to edit or cancel that order in point of sale. And again, in the next slide, we'll dig into that a little bit deeper. Um, I do want to make a little comment of the note at the bottom. Editing and canceling an order from the online channel is not capability that we currently support, um, but there, there, there are roadmap items and we do intend to look at lighting up some of these scenarios in the future that would allow essentially the shopper who placed the order online to be able to initiate maybe an edit, uh, you know, within certain uh, criteria at a certain timing, uh, they'd be able to maybe edit their order through the online channel or cancel their order through the online channel. So let's dig a little bit more into this enable order completion just to make sure that everyone understands what that is. Um, enable order completion is a setting on the call center channel configuration and it drives whether or not orders created in the call center will go through a specific order validation flow before the order gets released to fulfillment. Now, one of the key validations that is triggered when you turn enable order completion on is payment processing. Um, so if you turn enable order completion off in your call center channel, you will lose payment processing capabilities or at least the commerce payment processing capabilities. Um, so that means, you know, uh, capabilities of, of posting prepayments and, uh, you know, managing some of the um, more uh, robust um, credit card processing capabilities, those would all not be available to you if you have enable order completion off. Um, so we do find that for most of our customers, especially since most of our customers are in retail, um, that they need enable order completion to be on. It's a crucial uh, setting for their call center channels because they need that payment processing. Uh, it's also important to note that as of version 10.0.13, we are, as a, as a product, starting a process of requiring call center channels to have enable order completion turned on. Um, if you uh, want to take advantage of a new feature that we've enabled, which I'm going to be showcasing a lot today in my demo, called Omnichannel Commerce Payments, which allows a very seamless flow of you know, cross-channel order management, um, in order to use that feature, you will be required to have enable order completion turned on in your call center channel. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you enable that feature, this enable order completion flag is, is not even on your screen anymore. It will be hidden from you um, and it will just be enabled by default. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, so again, just to repeat, as mentioned, when this toggle is, en is enabled, you can create and edit orders in the call center. But you and you can fulfill those orders through either HQ or point of sale. So you can create an order in the call center channel that is to be uh, picked up in store, and you can process that pickup in the store without it, without issue. Um, but you will not be able to edit that order in point of sale. So once the order is created in the call center channel, if enable order completion is yes, and then you know for some reason someone in the store wants to edit that order through the point of sale application, you'll see that that is blocked at this time. Um, if you wanted to edit it, you could certainly open up a call center uh, application and edit the order in there, um, but you will not be able to edit it uh, through the point of sale application at this time. So finally, uh, we've talked about creating orders and the different kind of flows we can manage between creation and fulfillment. We've talked about the flows about editing and canceling and what we support and the one flow that we don't support. Um, now let's talk about returns. Um, so while we hope customers never return anything, we know it happens. Um, so here's some of the cross-channel, these are the, the cross-channel flows we support. I do want to make a note that these flows actually work for both cash and carry and customer orders. So we've, we've sort of left cash and carry out of the, the equation up until now because, again, you can't edit those orders. You don't fulfill those orders. They're immediately fulfilled as soon as they're created, um, but they can be returned. And so all of these flows are, are supported from a return perspective. So again, I'm not going to read the whole bullet list, but you know, just as an example, if I purchase something online, uh, the channel of creation was the online channel, but I can take it into a store and they'll be able to access that order and process a return through it through their store channel through the POS application. 
Um, I do have a little asterisk just to call out um, that today, if you buy something online, um, if you want to return it to what I call the warehouse, meaning I don't want to take it back to a store, but I just want to ship it back to the company and I want them to, to process a return, that would be an example of a return that's processed through the back office. Um, and just to call out that today, if you're using our e-commerce capabilities, we don't give the shopper the ability to initiate the return through the online channel today. That is, again, something else that is on our roadmap to be supported. But if there was a desire to have the customer sort of uh, pre-authorize their return and, you know, get permission, I guess, to to send it back to corporate before uh, they, they pack it up and ship it, uh, they would, you know, need to probably call into the call center or something today if you're just using our out-of-box capabilities to have that RMA created for them. But our goal is to, you know, at some point have, uh, have users, have shoppers themselves be able to initiate the return process online. So with that, let's watch a demo and see it in action. We're going to spend the next 20 minutes diving pretty deep into an end-to-end -end demonstration. We're going to buy online, edit in call center, and pick up in store. So let's start our omni-channel journey in the online channel. And I've already got a shopping cart going for a customer here. We've got one product in here. They're going to pick it up at the San Francisco store. And so let me go ahead and do the checkout to complete this online transaction. Uh, by the way, if you're seeing functionality here that looks new to you, um, that's probably because it is. Um, and there will be another tech talk in a couple of weeks that goes into some details about some new capabilities that we've added in the area of um, order pickup. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just put in my demo credit card here and just fill out the rest of this very quickly. We'll save that and we'll complete our required checkout steps and we'll place this order. So as discussed earlier in the presentation, this order currently resides in the Commerce Scale Unit in the channel database. Um, it has not synchronized real time back to HQ. I do not have any real time processing turned on. And so I'm going to need to uh, synchronize this. As mentioned, this is typically done with batch jobs that you can schedule to run every minute or so that will pull the, the raw transaction data from the channel and centralize it into our HQ database and create those sales orders. Uh, but for the purpose of demonstration today, I'm going to walk through the process uh, just manually to show you those steps. So I'm switching over to my back office application, Dynamics 365 Headquarters, as we, we often call it, Commerce Headquarters. Um, the kind of the main backend uh, application of the product. And I'm, I need to bring those e-commerce orders uh, down to, to, to this uh, back office application. And so as we discussed, this is done through distribution jobs. Um, I will go into the distribution schedule. And the job we use to bring the data down, we refer to it as the P job. It's an upload job. In your environment, you could potentially have multiple P jobs. It really depends on how many um, channel, channels you have, how many CSU units you have, how complicated your structure is. Um, but in my application, I just have one. And when I run this, it's actually going to take all the raw transaction data from any of my commerce channels, whether they be store or online, and bring those transactions down into the back office. And the other job that you're going to want to run, and again, if you're doing this manually, you would wait until you uh, ensure the, the P job had successfully run and the data was uh, applied properly to the back office. Uh, and then you would run the synchronized orders job. As mentioned earlier, typically you would just schedule these in batch and they would run in tandem and you know, any, anything that was picked up and, and synchronized by the P job would get picked up then by the next synchronized order job that was run. When you run the synchronized order job manually, you can choose specifically which channel you want to run it for. Uh, if you want to run it for all of your channels at once, you can just kind of use this hierarchy to choose. Since I'm just caring about uh, orders that were created in the uh, online store. This is the channel that I was working in. I'm just going to select that channel. And again, I'm going to run this manually for now. Another useful form in this process, especially if you're 
you know, running some tests is the online transaction form. If you look at the online store transactions form, this is where you can see all the transactions that were synchronized from the channel databases into the back office and their status. Um, you can, what I like to do is just add a filter here when I'm testing um, the order that I just placed online. If you remember when I completed my checkout, I was given a, a confirmation number in the back office that's referred to as the channel reference ID. So I'm just going to add the channel reference ID as a, a filter here and I'm going to paste in the confirmation number I received in my online order just so I can get right to that transaction that I'm testing with. We can see here that the transaction was uh, synchronized. We can actually see the order number that was created from the synchronization process. So this order is now fully synchronized in the back end. And what that means is now it's accessible from the call center, it's accessible from the stores if they need to recall this order to either fulfill it or, um, or process pickup. All of those capabilities are now available because that order is now in the centralized headquarters. So now that we've created the online order, let's switch gears and move to the call center channel. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to log in. I'm, I'm logged into the application as a call center user, and I want to just give a little bit of more explanation about the, what that means. So when you define a call center channel in the headquarters, the call center has channel users. I am logged in right now with my user of, of eight chains. And if you look at channel users for the Fabricam call center, we can see that I am uh, a user of this call center. That's really important because if there is not a link there, anybody can log in to the back office of, of commerce. Um, and you know maybe they think they're doing some call center functions, but unless they're tied by user ID to a call center channel, they are not call center users and the capabilities that you might be expecting to see would not light up. And if you're you know, experiencing that, the first thing you should check is to make sure your user that you're logged into the application with is actually configured as a call center user. In my case, I am a call center user. I'm going to start in the customer service form, just a preference. Uh, you could go right to what we call the all, all orders form. Um, there's different ways to access orders through HQ, but I sort of prefer this flow of going to the customer service screen. So from the customer service screen, I'm going to type in just the first name of the customer that I'm testing with. I don't have a very large customer database, so only one match is found. And I'm going to select that customer. The customer service form is nice because it gives you sort of a single view of all of the customer's orders, the status of those orders, the payment status. Um, you know, you can scroll down and look at uh, whatever order you're selected on. You can see the line details. So this is the order that we had just created in the online channel. In our scenario, let's say the customer calls into the call center. They realize they made a mistake. They meant to order two pairs of sunglasses. They only ordered one. They want to know if we can help them. So I can certainly do that. I'm just going to click on the sales order to start that process of editing it. This takes me into what we call the sales table form uh, where I can get to the order. And when you are working with call center, in order to make changes to orders, you do need to go into the modify mode first. That sort of tells the application that this order is going through changes. It actually flags on the order header a, a, a flag called do not process behind the scenes and what that allows us to do is is make sure that this order doesn't accidentally get picked up for fulfillment during this time because we, we kind of want to lock the order and, and hold it until we make finish making our changes. So while I'm in this modify mode, I can make many different types of changes. You know, if the customer wanted to add products, if they wanted to change their pickup location, uh, maybe they wanted a discount because they weren't happy with the price that they were charged online. Again, depending on my capabilities as a, and my security as a call center user, I can certainly do all of these things. But for the purpose of today's demo, I'm just going to do a real simple change here. I'm going to update the quantity from uh, one to two. And I'm getting prompted if I want to recalculate pricing based on this change, and I'll just accept that. And I can recalculate shipment dates, all of these things. Um, based on this change, we've, of course, increased the order value. We've added another pair of sunglasses. So, of course, our amount due is going to be increased. When you're working with call center and you have enable order completion turned on, this is where you get the benefits uh, of, of the omni-channel flow that you would not get if you had 
uh, not turned on enable order completion or omnichannel commerce payments features. When I click complete, this is going through that enable order completion flow and it's going to calculate the amount due and it's going to show me, okay, well, based on your changes, the new product total is 260. You've only paid online 139.43, uh, which you know was the amount due initially when we checked out online, but now I owe an additional 139.42. And I can see down here that there is a payment on file for 139.43, that's in an authorized state. That's the payment I created when I checked out my online cart. So there's a couple of ways I can handle this. We are going to be required to pay for this order in full. Call center likes to have a payment in full or at least within tolerances. So in uh, accounts receivable parameters, you can define some under overpay tolerances. So if you need to, maybe you could, you know, get away with underpaying or overpaying by a dollar or 50 cents. Um, really, it's whatever the business wants to define. But in general, call center is looking for coverage uh, of the of the order total with payments. I could add a second payment line here. So if for some reason the customer wanted to give me a different credit card or some other form of payment to pay for this additional balance due. That is an option. But more than likely this customer is just going to want to pay for the new total with the same card that they paid uh, with online. And so I'm going to now be able to edit this. And again, this is capability that will only be available to you if you have turned on the omnichannel commerce payments feature. I'm going to edit this payment. And instead of that credit card being just for 139.43, I'm going to change this to $260, which is the full amount. Now, remember when they checked out online and they put their credit card in, we only authorized the card for that amount of 139.43. We haven't captured it or collected that payment. So what happens when I adjust this amount due is you can see the status of that payment has changed. It's no longer in an authorized state. It's in a what we call not submitted state. Well, how do I get it submitted? Um, that's easy enough. We click on the submit button. So now that you know our balance due is, is zero, we're, um, oops, did I type in the wrong amount? I typed in the wrong amount. Uh, the amount due, oops, I was highlighting the wrong thing, 278.85. Uh, Let me just edit that again. I put in the wrong amount. 278.85 is our balance due. I was looking at the product total, not the, the total due. So now we should get a balance of zero, good. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and click submit to finalize this. What's happening behind the scenes is that original credit card payment uh, or authorization is gonna get voided and a new authorization is going to be created. If you're curious to kind of see that um, in the database, all you need to do is click on payments here and you can go into payment authorization details and you can see that history. So we originally authorized the 139.43, we voided that, and now we've got a new authorization for 278.85. So that is an example of something that we can do in terms of omni-channel order processing where we're editing an order in a different channel than the channel of creation. And this, in this case, we're showing an example of editing the order through the call center channel. Okay, so switching channels again, we're now in the point of sale channel or the store channel. I am logged in as a user in the San Francisco store, which if you remember is where my customer is going to ultimately pick up her products. The order was placed online. It was edited in call center with some quantities updated. And now we're going to kind of finalize the fulfillment and the pickup of that order through point of sale. So there's a, you know multiple ways that you can manage the fulfillment process of the order in point of sale. Um, we have some new features that were recently added uh, to our recall order form where I can open up this orders to pick up view. And from this view, I get a list of all the orders that uh, have a pickup mode of delivery for my store where the order is not fully invoiced yet. So there's either all lines are still open for processing or some of the lines are still open for pickup processing. And you can see the order that I was just editing uh, uh, in call center is here and we can even see the amount of two um, quantity ordered uh, based on our call center changes. So, in the point of sale application, you can just jump straight to the pickup process if you wanted to for the sake of just talking about some of the fulfillment capabilities. Uh, we'll, we'll walk through what we can do in terms of updating these lines to, you know, 
what I would call ready to pick up status. So once I select an order that I wanna work with, I can jump to this fulfill operation. And this is gonna, you know, just give me kind of like a view of, of what orders I, what lines, what products I need to pick and pack. In this case, it's very simple. It's a single order line. I just need to pick quantity two. Um, in the application, picking and marking items as picked is optional. It's not something that's required in order to process the order. Um, but it is, you know, again, if you wanna sort of track uh, the, the order fulfillment, you know, when you do mark this as picked, we are going to the headquarters and updating that line as picked right away. That's an example of a real-time service call that's happening right now. Why that is useful is, you know, it, it, we, we kind of want to make sure that nobody in the back office can maybe cancel this order now or do anything that they shouldn't do because we've essentially now sort of reserved that inventory, marked it as picked, and that's going to, you know, make that order a little bit harder for others in the back office to change. Uh, you know, they would they would be warned if they were trying to make changes to something that's already been picked. So it's always a good process, you know, good good recommendation of process to to mark these things as you go along. The other optional step is to mark your inventory as packed. Why marking inventory as packed when you're dealing with a customer pickup order is helpful is you can create uh, email notifications in our system that will send an email to the customer to let them know their order is ready for pickup. That email notification is triggered on the pack slip event today. So by me marking this now as packed, if I've set up my customer notifications properly, my customer will now get an email indicating that they can come to the store and, and pick up their order because everything is essentially ready to go. Okay, so those are our order fulfillment processes. As I mentioned, those are optional, but um, they are useful to ensure the order statuses are getting updated properly with what actually is going on with the order. Now, when we get to the pickup part of the uh, transaction, there's a couple different ways that we can initiate pickup as well. We can, again, open this orders to pick up because that order still is not uh, completed. It will show up in that list. I'm gonna to go to just this view called find and manage orders. This is the order recall form with no pre-filtered criteria. And I'm just gonna search for the order. So let's say my, my customer walks in and she either you know gives me her order number or um, you know her confirmation number and I wanna look up her transaction and complete her pickup. Now I'll be honest with you, I've forgotten my order number. So I'm just going to type my customer's name because uh, I do remember that, and that's one way I can get to this transaction. So the transaction at the top will be the most recent. Uh, here is the uh, quantity two. Now I will point out, this is something that uh, we are looking to correct. These statuses are pulled from the back office, and if any of you have worked with our application for any time and you're familiar with our supply chain capabilities, in headquarters. Um, when you mark an, an item as packed, the status is considered delivered. I know that doesn't really sound logical because we haven't actually delivered anything to the customer yet. Um, and so we're just pulling those statuses and translating them as they are in the back office for consistency sake. But I do realize that this can be confusing. So I just wanna point out that when you see a status of delivered uh, until we make any, you know, any changes to this uh, going forward, just know that what that means is those are packed lines. They are in a packed state. They're not completed yet. So now my customer's here. She wants to pick up her two pairs of sunglasses and I'm going to initiate the pickup operation. Again, this may look a little bit new to some of you guys and we'll have a tech talk more specifically on some of these uh, changes to the product that have been recently done. But I'm just gonna go ahead and process this pickup. Now, again, if you remember, we paid for this online with a credit card. We then edited the order in call center and added more money to that credit card, right? We're using that credit card to pay a higher amount. And because we have omni-channel commerce payments turned on, that token is shared across these channels. And so we're being asked, you know, hey, I detect that there's a payment. Do you want to use that payment or do you want to maybe pay a different way? Most of the time, of course, the customer would not want to change their payment. They're going to want to use the same payment that they applied online. Um, so I'm going to choose that as well to choose the available payment. 
And now we can see that that payment is applied to the order total. My amount due at pickup is zero because uh, we have that, that credit card on file, which we will finalize and capture once I complete this. So once we're done with this transaction, we can you know, pay this balance by just, we can just click the zeros here. That will uh, indicate that you know, no payment is needed. That's just a quick way to kind of finalize the transaction. And we get our change due pop up, uh, which, by the way, is configurable whether or not you want this pop up to appear. Uh, but in my my account, I'm showing the change due. Uh, if I had a register, you know, a receipt would print all of that good stuff. Um, and we've essentially completed our omni-channel flow. So we started in the in the online channel, creating an order. We edited that order in the call center channel, and then we finalized, fulfilled that order through the point of sale channel. So let's, okay, so if you weren't aware, you were just watching a video for the past 20 minutes, um, and that, that was really much needed because this process is pretty lengthy, uh, especially the steps to go through and synchronize order and things, so to make it just the most efficient uh, for the, the amount of time we have together, uh, we did, uh, did pre-record that. Um, but hopefully that demonstration has given you a good understanding of, you know, some of the capabilities that we can support and just kind of a good day in the life end-to-end -end example of, of using cross-channel order or omni-channel order management. Um, I want to spend a couple minutes at the end here just calling out a few things that you want to keep in mind if you want to really take advantage of omni-channel order management and you know, some, some things you should be aware of, um, kind of two big bigger topics here I'll talk about, and I'll give you some examples of each, are in the areas of pricing uh, and taxes. So, you know, when we talk about creating an order in one channel and editing, editing it or fulfilling it or returning it in another, um, you know, we have to kind of have some guidelines or rules. And so when it comes to pricing, the price that uh, is set up for the product in the channel of creation is always respected. So if you're familiar enough with our product, you may know that we have very flexible pricing capabilities. You can have a product and you could charge a different sales price to customers depending on the channel they purchase in. So maybe I pay $200 if I buy this item online, but if I buy it in store, it's only $190. Um, that is certainly a capability that we have and you, know, you can take advantage of. Um, uh, but you know, when it comes to omni-channel flows, you've just kind of got to be aware of how that's going to behave. And so I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Um, the channel that you create the order in is always where we, or the order line, I should say, in is always where we pull pricing from. Um, same with taxes. Um, you know, when you create an order in a channel, the tax setup of that channel is going to be respected. Um, but then if you start editing that order or doing pickups in another channel where maybe the price rules and uh, setup is different, you could potentially see some maybe unexpected behavior. Um, and so I, again, just want to call out some examples of, of you know, where you're going to see maybe some things that, you know, whether or not you agree that it should behave this way or not, um, I, I am going to point out that this is the behavior that we have today. So if this behavior is something that, you know, doesn't make sense for your organization or you would expect it to behave a different way, that might mean that, you know, you might have to do some extensions or customizations to get the flow the way you want. But I just want to call out, it's super important to test these things up front to make sure you understand how these behaviors will work. Um, so here's a good example of pricing. Um, so I've got a product, this sunshine yellow leather satchel, and it's normal everyday price is $240. So in all my channels, unless I've, I've specified otherwise, we sell this product for $240. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side here, I've created a trade agreement just for my San Francisco store. So in San Francisco, this item sells for $200 for whatever reason. Um, so there's a price difference if you buy it in San Francisco versus if you buy it anywhere else. If I take an order for this product online, if you'll note, I am creating an order for this product, and when I created the order, I, I said I want to pick it up in the San Francisco store. So, you know, maybe some of you might assume or expect the San Francisco store prices would be charged. That is not is what hap is, that's not what is going to happen. And again, this is by design. This is how this works. And so I just want to make sure you're aware. You can see the price is 240. That is the price being calculated in the channel of creation. So this order was created and is essentially owned by uh, the online channel. 
And in the online channel, it doesn't matter what store you're picking it up in or if you're shipping it to home, uh, we are going to be using the prices as defined in the online channel. Um, so how does that work when you go to edit the order in point of sale? So let's say after the order is placed, for some reason the customer calls the store and says, can you make a change? Can you, maybe they wanna add the same item a second time, kind of like my example earlier. They wanna increase the quantity from one to two. When I start to edit this order in the point of sale, you're gonna note the price doesn't change. So we will always maintain that original price. We're not gonna recalculate systematically when you go into edit mode and say, oh, we're now in the San Francisco store, this purse is now $200. Um, it, will, it will keep that original price intact. But if, the, if your intent is to add a second purse, so the customer says, I, wanna, I want two of these. If I add that same item, what's gonna happen is we're gonna add a second line. Now we're respecting the channel you're in. So any new lines created will utilize the price of the, the channel you're in, which is in this case, San Francisco. So again, this is very, one of these, you know, it might be a, an off scenario, you might never see it, but I wanna call these things out um, so that you're aware of, you know, this behavior is normal. This is uh, at least, you know, it's, it's what we support out of the box. Again, you know, if your organization or your customers would expect something different, then you might wanna investigate, you know, some extensions or changes, but this is what, what the behavior would be out of the box. Um, a good tax example, we've, we've actually seen this a couple times, um, is, is as you may know, we have a feature in our system where you can configure uh, price include sales tax. Um, so in the channels, you can say in this channel, my prices actually have the sales tax embedded in, into the price. Well, if all of your channels don't use price include sales tax, again, something to be cautious of or be aware of when you start doing omni-channel flows. So here's an example of, again, I'm taking an order in the online channel. My online channel does not have price include sales tax configured. So the, the order is actually having sales tax calculated. You'll note that I'm picking it up in the San Francisco store. My San Francisco store is configured with price include sales tax enabled. So what's gonna happen on this next slide, you can kind of see these two screenshots side by side. The screen on the left is your order recap from, from the online channel. The screen on the right is your point of sale application. When I go to pick that order up in the point of sale, you can see what happened to the online totals. The swing dress, instead of being $165 like it was online, has now been recalculated to 153.85 because we're essentially taking that sales tax amount and uh, assuming it's part of the product sales price. Um, and so, um, you know, that's again, just uh, something very important to keep in mind. If you don't have consistent rules across channels, uh, you know, when it comes to this area of taxes, um, just, just test, uh, make sure that, you know, you're getting the results that you want and just know that, you know, we, we are going to respect the channel of uh, pickup in this case, as, as far as their tax rules. Um, really quick before we hit Q&A, some other things you want to think about when you're testing and you're thinking about going omni-channel and using some of these great capabilities. Uh, keep in mind that the concept of deposits is something that is only supported in the point of sale channel. So today when you create a customer order in the point of sale channel, you have an option of configuring a deposit percentage amount. So maybe when the customer creates the transaction, you wanna collect 10% upfront and then they pay the balance at the time of, of order fulfillment. Um, that concept doesn't exist in our online or our call center channels today. So what that means is, let's say I created an order in point of sale, I paid a 10% deposit, and now I wanna edit that order in call center. As we discussed earlier, call center has an expectation of 100% payment coverage, uh, you know, when, when enable order completion is true and you're using our payment processing capabilities. Um, you know, and I mentioned that there's a tolerance that you can set, so it, it but it basically expects 100% coverage. So if you edit that order in call center and you go through the completion flow, call center is going to say, you, you need to apply more payment. You're out of balance. There's a balance due here that, that exceeds my tolerance. Um, so again, that's just something to think about and keep in mind. Uh, modes of delivery. 
if you have inconsistent modes of delivery set up for your channels, you know, I've got certain modes of delivery that work in one channel and don't work in another, you could run into some speed bumps if you're doing cross channel things. So you want to strive for consistency in your modes of delivery as much as possible, or at least for the orders that you know you're going to, to be using cross channel capabilities. Uh, your payment methods, the same thing. Uh, you know, if I take an order in the point of sale and I pay with a loyalty card, and then I go to edit that order in call center, but call center doesn't understand loyalty cards because it hasn't been configured in that channel, that can end up being a problem for you. Um, and charges. So again, we have you know these auto charges that can get calculated when you place an order, calculating freight. Again, sometimes marketers get, get kind of creative and they say, oh, let's, let's charge $20 for UPS ground in the online channel, but only $15 for UPS ground in the stores. You know, that, that may sound like a great marketing initiative, but then think about how that might affect cross-channel flows and if the customer shipping charges get recalculated uh, and go higher or lower once an, uh, an edit occurs, um, you know, that might not be what the customer would expect. Um, so again, just test these things through and make sure that uh, what you're seeing meets your business needs. Uh, I, as I said, you know, I would say probably 90% of the time, if you're not happy with what you're seeing, it, it wouldn't be considered a bug. It would just be considered our standard out of the box behavior. And so that's when, you know, you might need to look at doing some extensions if you need to change that standard behavior. Um, so with that, we've got uh, almost 10 minutes here. So I don't know, Ruben, if you wanted to come off mute, if there's any Q&A that you wanna, wanna um, review. Hi, Holly, yeah, so I'm um, just publishing one question here. And I'll read it to you. Great. The, the question is, are there any plans to introduce in the future any capability in order to manage the following scenarios? First scenario, customer order where a customer chooses to pick up an item within a store location with no current availability for it. Um, so the idea is, would that could, could that initiate a transfer order linked uh -huh. to the customer order um, automatically? Yeah. So, Okay, yeah, so so not really anything on our roadmap to do that. Um, you know, in in our supply chain capabilities, so again, you know when you when you when you use Dynamics three sixty five commerce, you do have an option of sort of licensing the full supply chain or just the commerce components. If you're licensing the full supply chain, I mean, there are capabilities there that can automate uh, replenishment and transfers based on demand. So while I would say from our commerce team, that's not something that we have on on plan. If you were to create an order today for, let's say, the San Francisco store, just using my example, and that uh, and that order, uh, that product had no inventory in the San Francisco store, you can use the demand planning and replenishment capabilities of the supply chain to get that inventory transferred from from a place where where you may have it to that store. Um, so so just keep that in mind and maybe look to investigate that, but. Um, Outside of the supply chain capabilities, the commerce team doesn't plan to do any additional work there. Great, thank you. Uh, second question is intercompany DOM, uh, able <laughs> to assign sales order line to warehouses within a different company. Um, yeah, intercompany DOM, I don't have a great answer for that. I'm not the, the lead PM on DOM. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think DOM works with intercompany right now. Um, I don't know what the roadmap is on that, unfortunately. So um, we can probably get you uh, connected with the PM who owns that area, maybe to get your question answered. Okay, and that's that's all of the questions. Awesome. Great. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Evan to wrap it up. This slide just uh, gives you uh, some uh, additional links that you can check out, uh, upcoming talks, past talks, and then some articles that are relevant uh, to this topic today. Perfect. Thank you, Holly. Um, we would like to get your feedback on today's session. I've posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We value your feedback and welcome your input on how we did today and what you would like to see in future sessions. That survey scores on a scale from one to five, with five being the highest score possible, and we thank you for your participation in that. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter and a thank you to our audience for logging in and joining us today. Please stay safe and have a great rest of your day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.